And this is the beginning of the internet, so yep. it isn't yet ubiquitous. <laughs> yeah. It isn't to the place where you know you simply turn on your phone and then there's. Yep. Um, and and we've got to come to that. I, but I don't want to lose uh, before we leave the world of uh, before we leave Toronto and before we leave Babylon. Um, I'm struck actually a little dumbstruck by how prescient the show was for things that would happen a decade later. Uh, there's marriage, uh, and uh, you know, you saw a brief scene that we cut, probably it's not going to be in the, the film, but the, the whole idea of whether or not marriage is actually even a good thing, uh, which became, you know, a lot of people in the the uh, LGBT community, particularly gay men, said, this is just assimilation. Mm -hmm. The hell do we need marriage for? And that was your character's point of view. Yep. Uh, and yet young people said, we need it because this is who we are. It was driven from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. When you were doing this, this is way ahead of, there was marriage anywhere, barely. Mm -hmm. Civil unions in a couple places, marriage in Massachusetts just started while the show was on. Canada was where you know the marriage had to take place on the show. Did that all enter into your consciousness of like we're telling stories that are fantasy that are going to become fact? Did you have some sense that this was you know uh, portents of things to come when you were telling these stories? Um, the stories that we were telling that specifically became or were in some sense prescient in terms of them sort of manifesting themselves in real time later. Uh, the marriage concept, the idea, the potential, yes, my character called that assimilation. He responded to that with a bit of disdain. I think a lot of that, for me as an actor, it came from his understanding of his family. Why would you want to mimic the train wreck that is traditional marriage, regardless of who's married. I mean, it doesn't matter to me, it could be a parakeet, a caterpillar, you know, it's going to end in tears. And why are you wasting your time? There's more fun to be had. Anyway, but when we were making the show and shooting th th those storylines, I, I, I think that it, it's, we still felt so much outside of the main just in terms of what else was on television, in terms of what stories were being told in prime time, whether however that was working. I kind of felt like we were the redheaded stepchildren and all the stuff that we were doing was sort of like, you know, um, a private showing. It wasn't gonna be ex exported to the main population, you know? So when it did come through, it, I didn't feel like I could participate in claiming any credit for that. I just, I, I, and I, when it was happening, it felt like we're just telling the stories of a part of our, a part of our population that's downtrodden and uh, locked away and want freedom and want equal rights, you know? Peter said to us that he believes that without queers folk, maybe Modern Family, Ellen, some of the others, we don't get to marriage equality as quickly as we did, which even though it seems like it, it took a long time, mm -hmm. when it finally happened, it happened fairly quickly relative to, say, other kinds of civil rights. Looking back at it now, now after the fact, do you see the impact that it had? Yeah, after the fact, after the time that's passed, it's much easier to see now. There's hindsight. There's also, it's either to put the momentum into perspective and Going back to the, you know, what the, your film is about and what this project is about, the the power of the of the medium and the power of the introduction of an idea into a medium that's so powerful, and it's sort of it's a slow burn for a, for a long time. There's a piece here and there's a piece here and there's a piece here, and it's sort of like a learning curve and other and or or like some sort of market graph where here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. Some at some point it just gets taken to heaven, you know, the, the idea becomes too powerful, becomes there's too much weight, there's too many people behind it, and, and there's too much 
understanding, there's awareness. You can't see truth and reality over and over again and see that those are just other human beings. Those are your your fellow citizens. Those are people that might live down the street from you. Those are people that you go to church with. They're people that you grew up with. It just settles in. It settles in. Um, it's a modern family. It's a modern family. Absolutely. As it were. Yeah. We've got one more in Toronto and then I want to leave there and it was literally the last moment. Uh, Babylon explodes. I talked to Ron and Dan about this. They, they thought at the time, well, maybe we've jumped the shark. Maybe that's too much. Maybe that's just, you know, beyond the pale. First off, do you remember when you saw that script and you saw what was going to happen? Do you remember how you felt about it? Um, I felt that... Um You know, part of me, to be honest, was kind of like, uh, kind of like that sense of maybe I've seen too many procedurals, maybe I've read too many detective stories. There's going to be a copycat. Someone's going to see something. And they're going to use that as motivation. I hope that that's not what happens here. I would hate for that to be the story point that interrupts. But the point of the story point of the whole story, which is this is really what's happening in our world, on our show. This is happening to our characters. And it could happen, and it will happen, and it's going to happen. And I just hope that it happens less than more, and I hope that as many people will make it out as they can, you know? That's was my, I mean, if you're asking me how I responded when I saw the script, anything that you put into the public consciousness can replicate itself, you know? And again, I'd love for you to say this in the answer, but fast forward to a few months ago in a place you're familiar with, Florida, Orlando. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a bomb, but it might as well have been a right. bomb. Yeah. Did that resonate for you, did it take you back and realize that this was, for those people in that club, it was very much the same sensation that you filmed a decade ago? I think that what happened in Orlando, certainly it reminded me of that storyline that we were shooting and the club being attacked and that when you're it's that constant shock. I mean, if you're in the, if you're in, if you're part of an attack, thank God, I, I, I have not experienced that yet. But for the people that are there, it's it's war. You know, it's war. And we're, to a certain degree, a very blessed country. We experience that minimally in terms of the rest of the planet and what's going on in our world right now. But I was reminded of that. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not strong enough, I don't think, or clearly cognizant enough of the circumstances to feel anything other than. And I think this is the human. This is everyone's reaction. It's horror. It's it's terror. It's it's anger. It's it's just it's preposterous. Why? There is no justification. And there's no logical justification of any justification that you could make or that you could come up with. It's, um, an, it's, an, it's an evil act, you know? It is that. Uh, uh, we have one more phase to go. And I, Do you need some water? Are you good? Uh, I could use a little sip of water, actually. Yeah. Uh, Ray, can Thank we get some water? Thank you. Now, we're, now we're, we have ended in Toronto, and that's where I want to finish. And as we talked about on the phone, anything you, I mean, I'm, I'm 
asking questions, but they're really, they're, they're less questions than more designed to give you a place to jump off from. Mm -hmm. uh, wherever you want to go is where I want you to go. So that's, that's a conversation, not an interview. Okay. Thanks. Thanks that's a lot. Right. Um, and if you can, thanks. Um, are, do we have speed? Are we good? Thanks a lot. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Let me let me know when we're good. We're good. So this is the power of television, and that's where we came in. That's where we'll end. But it's it's not something that ends with a a whimper. Uh, you had never done television until you stepped off that plane in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And now, the thing for which you are best known, and you've done plenty of television since then, but you're known for television. Uh, mm -hmm. That changed how people view you in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it changed how you view yourself, but it certainly changed the way people see you, yep. which is what happens with this medium. Yep. So. This is really what I want to talk to you about, is that was a big thing to have happen for a guy who, you know, was flipping a coin to go to Chicago or New York. Right. Let's start with that question. How did being on television change you and change the way you live in the world? How did being on television change the way that I live and my way of being in the world is immediately uh, I was able to pay off my student loans. Uh, to be honest, the IRS, the IRS just took them out of my first paycheck, <laughs> which was good because I was getting far behind. Um, and it allowed me that first job on television, working on television, to find a new family of people similar to what you find in the theater, but the circumstances were extreme. The story was extreme sometimes, not every day, but a lot of times the stories we, we were telling were extreme. My character was an extreme character. His attack on life was uh, not light. He was full bore all the time. And so the, a lot of the scenes that I played were a part of that, told that story. There was a lot of work, a lot of hours, a lot of confusion about whether or not I was doing a good job or not. But I was somewhat pulled up by my bootstraps because I was a working actor, I was an adult who could pay their bills and give something to something. That was the immediate impact. I think the secondary impacts uh, I still feel now, but there became attention that came to me from strangers who assumed that I was the person that was in the glass box that I was a bad version of the person in the black box, the, the, the glass box, that I, that I was horrible, that my performance was sub subhuman or whatever it was. I mean, there's all these kinds of things, you know, because once you put yourself out there, you put yourself out there and you're, you're fair game for whatever. Uh, speculation about whether or not I was a closeted, internalized, hiding gay man playing the most in your face out there gay man on television and how preposterous that would be. Um, How'd that feel? Um, surrealistic, basically. I mean, I, it's, 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 a, it's an impossible conversation to have. You know that I'm not the guy that's on the show, right? I'm not that guy. And even if I was that guy, I'm not that guy. And even if I was that guy that I'm not that guy, how would you know if I was telling you the truth anyway? So this 
extreme debate that we're locked in right now, we're basically just wasting time. This conversation is never going to end up anywhere. So watch me on the box and direct all of your concerns, compliments, criticism to him, because that's him. It's not me. How often did that happen to you? Uh, more than the now. I mean, I've been interrupted at dinner, sitting at a table with a woman who clearly I'm having dinner with by a gay man who wants to come and put his crotch in my face and stand right by my table and mad dog me from the top. I guess because he either wants me to get up and get into a fight with him or kiss him or ask him on a date or ask my date to leave and he should take her seat. Um, Kenny, when it put me through my paces, can you really do it, man? Can you really do it? And I can't really do it because I'm not at work, but um, that was part of it. Um, and then part of it has been, how could you ever, how could you ever play that part, man? How could you, how could you do that? How could you, how could you, how could you do all that gay stuff that you did? You know, once again, not getting the message that I'm, I'm, I'm making something, I'm creating something. I'm, I'm just a cog in a machine that was built by someone else that I like and I'm trying, I'm trying to contribute to. It has nothing to do with you and whatever you think about it, you're welcome to it, but it has nothing to do with me. No one ever, I, I'm guessing now, but I think I'm right. No one goes up to Michael C. Hall and says, how could you be Dexter? Why, why would you treat people that way? Because they know that's fantasy, not fact. Right. But yet when it's sex, it's something different. Yeah. Why? Well, the reason that people cannot sometimes so easily differentiate between, I think, the actor and the person that they're seeing being portrayed, for instance, Brian Kinney and all of the sex that he had and all of what were considered um, by some deviant and by some perverse and by some anti-Christian and some sinful and some probably communist or whatever they think it is. Um, sex is sex. It's palpable. It's visceral. It's, it's a physical expression of things that we either have in our imagination or in our heart or in both places at the same time. And so to see another person engage in that in a way that seems that they're believing what they're doing, that they're supporting what they're doing, that it's not just a physicalization, it's not just a pantomime, it's actually, it seems like that person who is that character believes what that character is doing is actually true. But that's just the game anyway. When you put sex on top of it, or you put that inside a sexual act, it's supercharged. And then when you have a sexual political aspect to it, which we're still living in that world, there's still a sexual political aspect to gay or straight, you know, people, it's very hard for them to extract me or themselves from that. And it's, a, it's very difficult for them not to judge me as a person as to how I fit into that, into that, into that world or into that character's world. When you stop playing Brian Kinney, mm -hmm. did your feeling about that character change in any way? Um, when I stopped playing Brian character, <clears throat> after playing Brian Kinney as a character, the way that my feelings about him have changed is that I just, um, I wish I could go back and do it better, you know? Not all of it. I, I, I'm not. I'm not reminiscent, or painfully reminiscent, or whatever the phrase is. I, I'm. I'm not lonely for the times that I spent with him that were very just difficult and somewhat sometimes embarrassing. And but I wish I could have played him stronger. There are aspects of him that I understand more now, just because with age and time, looking back, there are certain points that I wish I'd made more clearly and there's certain points I wish I hadn't hit so hard. I wish, you know, I just want to go back. I want to, I want to fill in some of those colors, you know. Some of the times that I think that I, 
some of moments of finesse that I, I didn't get, I didn't get to. But there's never a moment, uh, or has there been a moment, when you're having dinner with a woman in a restaurant and someone sees you as Brian Kinney and not Gail Harold that you say, God damn, I wish I hadn't done that. There hasn't been a moment in a restaurant where I was having dinner with a woman where I realized, where I thought, God damn, I hadn't done that. I mean, there was one time where there was some very rude behavior that was pushed on me, but that, that, that didn't make me at that moment. That's not the response that I had. I didn't regret. I, I don't regret doing that ever. I, I, I sometimes am frustrated by the effect that certain people speculating about who I am as a person and therefore what is true for me and therefore why am I doing what I'm doing, sometimes that can bleed through to the people that I'm with and it affects them and it hurts them or it makes them suspicious or, and that's just roll the dice, you know. I can't change the past, I can't prevent people from speculating and I can't ever change what a bunch of anonymous people out in the internet or wherever it is Whatever they're going to do, is that what they're going to do, you know? Sometimes, is it irritating? Yes. Am I shameful or do I regret doing it? Hell no. Never. Never. So we're back to how television has changed the way you are in the world. And one of the things it's done is that you strike me as someone who, even from a very early age, you live inside yourself, and that's just who you are. A lot of people, you know, are very, they, they wear themselves on their sleeves. Some people do not. It must be hard to be someone who, you could be across the street, and people spot you and pick you out of a crowd. You lose anonymity when you have that kind of ubiquity that television gives you. What about that? What about that part of it? The, the, forget about the role now, just the fact of being a public person mm -hmm. who didn't set out to be one. Um, being a public person, the ubiquity of television and all that an anonymity going away. Initially, th there's a shock. There's a, it's a difficult adjustment. It takes some time. I'm not an extremely extroverted person. I don't want all my stuff out on the street all the time. But the counterpoint to that is that the only reason that my stuff would be out on the street and that people would recognize me is that I was able to f find a spot in the world that I want to live in doing the, the work that I want to do. So the payoff is not so bad. Sometimes it's extreme and it can be invasive and it can be slightly destabilizing and it can make you uncomfortable and it can be borderline seemingly dangerous sometimes because some some of those impulses aren't they're, they're not main they're not managed very well you know I've I've I've, I've experienced being star struck my star star struck myself I can remember standing about seven feet away from Lou Reed one time and feeling like my knees were going to just disintegrate into my into my shoes, you know? And that's a feeling that I had never experienced that before, but when it, over, it overcomes you, it overcomes you. And if I have ever had even a, just a slice of that kind of effect on someone, because something that I was involved in generated a reaction based on enjoying the work that I've done. That's all, it's fine. It's all, the rest of it's you know, I, I'm not going to call bullshit, but I'm just going to tell you, you know this. You know this. That you saw it the other night at the restaurant, but that was the millionth time that's happened to you in a decade, that people have told you how much that part affected them. Good, bad, and indifferent, but it mm -hmm. affected them. It moved them. It touched them in a way that they had to tell you about. I know when you were doing it, it's almost better to block that out. Mm -hmm. But now it's 10 years on. Yeah. What happens when you hear that, when someone says, and, and uh, any examples are, are welcome, mm -hmm. 
What are some of the ways that people have said that Brian Kinney has affected them that you've heard? There have been there have been people that have approached me to tell me their experience of watching Queer's Folk and specifically watching what the character that I played in that in that project meant to them at times. And sometimes it's kind of embarrassing. I mean I get a little bit freaked out. He was such a he was such a marauder of the nightclub world that some of the things that they refer to it's not the most comfortable conversation to have with a complete stranger. Um, but many times and more so than not, it's sort of um thanking me somehow for pushing a message forward and helping them believe that there was more to the picture than what was readily available at the time. You know, it, it's been a long time since that show came through and, uh, and has, the effect is, is lingering to some degree, but it, it feels good. It feels good to know that some people, some places, sometimes have looked upon the work that we did and I was a part of that and felt something real and that they could that they could relate to and that they could feel good about. And all of that is the if you will, the global. The the, the very specific part and power of this show that set it apart from anything that preceded it and arguably anything that has succeeded it mm. is sexuality. It's a very strong component of owning your sexuality, not mm -hmm. hiding it, not apologizing for it, and particularly Brian not mm -hmm. apologizing for it, but a lot of people. Yep. Uh, Peter made the same point. Feminine man, but unapologetic about it. Right. That's really what I think I want to, if you'll pardon the way I phrase this, drill down to, mm -hmm. is, is the sexuality of that role. That was something that I don't think anyone could have anticipated. Uh, I, I think it was Sharon who said the other night to me when she said it, the only reason, uh, the, the only question she had was, are you going to actually film what I'm reading here? Because <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't believe it's ever going to make it to air. Mm -hmm. Well, it did for, for years. Mm -hmm. That's the part that was life-affirming for a lot of people and life-changing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. How about for you? The sexuality in the show, uh, specifically as it is connected to my character and what my character portrayed and his life and how that story was told and how that connects to sexuality. Sexuality, sex, the act of sex, fucking, making love, whatever, it's just part of what human beings do. It's what we do. It's what squirrels do. It's what butterflies do. We do it with a lot more flair, you might say, maybe not, um, and a lot more imagination, and a lot more philosophy, and a lot more religion, and a lot more obsession. But it's still just something that we do. And we do it because we need to make more people, certainly, on one level, but we also do it because it really feels good. And it's a power game, and it's a game of expression, and it's a game of life, of I'm alive now. I'm not going to be here for much longer in the grand scheme of things. I want to I be here. And I think for, for me, with Brian, a lot of the way that I looked at him was wrapped up in that. Brian, the way that I understood him and the way that I let him get inside me was... It's very simple. It's very simple. I'm alive. I live in Pittsburgh. I like men, not just as friends. I'm also a human being, and my gear works, so I want to have sex. I like to have sex a lot. That's the story. Now, I'm good at what I do. I'm an advertising exec. I have decent taste. I'm crass. I'm sm snarky, and I'm very sarcastic, 
and a lot of people maybe want to kill them, but that doesn't change the fact that I'm a man, my sex organs work, I'm not attracted to women for whatever reason. I didn't create the human race, so I don't know how that works, and maybe someday somebody will, but for the moment, nobody does. I just know what makes me excited, or gets me up, or gets me down, or however you want to put it. That was Brian, you know? I mean, he wanted what he wanted, and he was going to get it, and he didn't care. And it's not because he didn't care about other people. It's because that he had sort of equated reality with satisfaction, and he was acknowledging his animal side, and not to say that the animal side is better or worse than the intellectual side or the spiritual side, but it's a side, and it's one of the things that he enjoyed expressing. So we just have to be honest with each other. Everybody, whether you like it or not, has sex in your brain somewhere, and hopefully it's in your body a lot too. So get over it, right? Just get over it and just do it. Be safe, but just do it. You just got a sponsored by Nike. Um, <laughs> right. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> the difference, though, with with QAF and the difference with what you just said, mm -hmm. you used every word but shame, mm -hmm. and it was sex without shame. Yeah. And that was something new for gay people to see. There was no apology for it. There were complications from it, there mm -hmm. were difficulties, there were all the things that human beings feel, mm -hmm. but there was no shame, and that was something new. Did you understand that? I think our portrayal of the, of, of the, the, the characters that were in the show, and the, the sh there was, this was a show about a group of gay men and women and their, family, their families, um, of course, it's in, going to incorporate their sex life, and so we're going to see that. We're going to see it much more so than many other shows had at that point shown us. But I, I think at the time, I, I wasn't quite clear on the impact it was going to have. All I know is that it, it, you know, if you walk down your street and you pull the facade off all the houses on your, your block, you're going to see stuff, right? You're going to see the truth. You're going to see things that people are hiding, you're going to see the things people aren't hiding, they're just not doing it in public. But it's an equalizer. It's a democratic equalizer. What we showed brought something that had been repressed and constrained out into the public, out into the front. We put it to the front of the room and we said, this is what our characters do. This is what they believe. This is what they don't believe. This is how they screw up. This is how they do well. This is how they do poorly. But their sexual identity is part of it and people out there that are watching the show and you see some aspect of yourself in there you're going to see your sex life too I didn't realize at the time how far reaching that would be and I'm glad that it was able to let people feel a little bit more at ease with their desires and 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 the things that move them you know a lot more than at ease uh, it's funny though, we, we interviewed a kid who was on Glee uh, <coughs> earlier today, and the big thing that he did was he, he was closeted, he kissed a guy in a locker room and called his dad and his, it, it, when he got the part and said, you know, this is in the script today and I'm going to do this, and his dad said, that's great. Did you get positive regard from the people in your life? Were you supported by people around you as this was happening? Primarily, yeah. I was never overtly ridiculed from people that I knew, you know. No one that I, I knew ever gave me any, any grief about it. I think the people that I had known in my life that would have done that, I was, had been removed from them for years, so they weren't, they didn't have any input in my life anyway. Um, some of the people that I knew were fascinated and trying to figure out how how can you how can you do that? How do you get through the day? How do you and um, but no no real ridicule from friends from people that I 
I respect it. I mean, I, I have heard myself and my performance ridiculed by people. I've heard them do it in my presence and when they weren't aware that I was there, even when I, they knew I was there. But it's the way it is. You won't hear that from anyone on this side of this chair. Um, I will say that I think the way that it resonated for you when you saw uh, the uh, UK version mm -hmm. is what happens now because most Americans have not seen the UK version, they've seen this one. Mm -hmm. And you know that this is still going on. This is something that I didn't know until Peter sat in that chair and told us that the largest um, gathering place for uh, gay people in China is QAF US, its website. And you know, the Chinese as a culture and as a government are not terribly gay friendly. No. But QAF US is where Chinese gay people go watching the show. Mm -hmm to see themselves and to find common ground. So that's good. That's a billion people, billion three. Right. So this is gonna go on for a while. And thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I wanna ask Asher before I let you go if I've missed anything. Asher? I think we got it all.